Welcome. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of things before we get going. The first is that virtual VBS is fast approaching. It's going to be July 10th through 12th, and if you haven't signed your child up yet and would like to do so, uh, you may do so online through our website. Another thing, congregational meeting, a email will go out to all our members today with a list of names to be selected for our pastor nominating committee. And so you will have from today through July 5th to cast your vote to select our pastor nominating committee. And speaking of July 5th, we have a real treat throughout the month of July, and that is that the Reverend Harry Sly and the Reverend Dr. Rick Myers will be preaching for us throughout the month. Uh, the first two Sundays, July 5th, and the following will be Harry in the pulpit, and the last two Sundays will be Rick Myers in the pulpit. And we're so grateful for them, for their ministry, and for their heart to do this. And um, I'm particularly grateful because I'll get to take a little time off and uh, enjoy a little of the summer. Also, we will go to one service for the month of July. So just stay tuned to the newsletter, to Facebook, and we will provide more information with that. Well, with that, let us worship God together. and prayer of confession. Let us pray. God, you send us as prophets to proclaim your coming reign. You send us out as witnesses to embody your justice, kindness, and mercy. Yet we shrink from your call to serve as messengers of your kingdom. We cling to safe surroundings and turn from the demands of discipleship. Forgive us, we pray. Embolden us and send us again as heralds of your good news. Please take the next few moments for a prayer of silent personal confession. Friends, hear the good news. In Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. <laughs> 
everything in the Christian life begins with grace. It's all sustained by grace. It all points to grace. And it all ends with God's grace. Well, we've made it. This is the last sermon in our look at the letter of, to the Philippians. Nine weeks ago, we looked at the salutation of the letter where Paul said, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about how behind that word grace lies the entirety of the gospel message. And I mentioned the helpful acrostic uh, for grace defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is the message, the event, and the reality for us of the one who was crucified and risen. The cross of Christ is the grace of God, and grace is the self-giving action of God toward sinners. Grace is something that God chooses to give us, meaning that it is 100% a gift, something that we receive. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. It is a gift from God. And if we choose to embrace God's grace, our lives are changed because of it. We live with an attitude of gratitude. We are thankful and prayerful. We have a greater purpose and perspective on life. We are Christ-exalting and Christ-imitating. We live lives of humility. We are an encouraging presence for others, and grace changes us daily. We are changed because of it. And because of God's grace— We live lives that are filled with joy, and we have reason to rejoice. In grace, as we talked about last week, we enter into relationship and communion with God. Our heart's greatest joy is to delight in the Lord, and we talked about how joy is this deep and abiding inner peace. Where fear closes us off and turns us inward, joy opens us up and compels us outward. Joy is an outside expression of the grace that we have received, and joy is found in walking in obedience to God. We also looked at last week how words like joy and rejoice and thanks and forgive and gift in the Greek are all connected uh, to the word grace and that they share the same root. Well, today we will continue in Philippians, picking up in chapter 4 at verse 10, And in this final section of Philippians, we learn a little more of the context uh, of the relationship between Paul and the church in Philippi. And we also see from this passage yet another example of what it means to live grace-filled lives. Let us pray. Lord, calm our minds and hearts. How do we find ourselves feeling stressed, worried, annoyed, frustrated, maybe even scared. There's a lot to distract us right now, but help us now to put all that aside and draw near to you. Help us to know and see your grace more and more. Amen. One thing before I get uh, to our text this week, it's one thing to read about history, you know, about events, and it's quite another to read a letter or a diary section Uh, because a letter or a diary written in the context of history gives us a deeper glimpse into what's going on. You know, it's one thing to read about Martin Luther King Jr. It's another thing to read his letter from Birmingham jail. It's one thing to read about the Holocaust, but it's another thing to read the diary of Anne Frank. Philippians is not a lesson about history. It is a glimpse into a moment in time itself. So remember the drama here. Remember that it wasn't safe to be a Christian at that time. Remember that there was a lot at stake and there are a lot of unknowns for them. They find themselves in uncertain times, not knowing what the future would look like. But again, we see from our text examples of what it means to live grace-filled lives in the midst of circumstances. So picking up now in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 23. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, 
and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Well, things have not been easy for Paul. Paul has been in the trenches, so to say, spreading the gospel. And because of that, he has been slandered and beaten and thrown in prison. He's been laying it all on the line for Christ. And he says he knows what it is to have little. And he knows what it is to have plenty, which having plenty for him is probably a lot less than what we would call having plenty. He then says, in any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. In our text today, Paul also talks about how the Philippians have been great supporters for him. Remember that all throughout the letter, Paul has used words like koinonia, which means that they're, they are sharers in, that they have fellowship with one another, with him. And he uses the prefix sin, S-Y-N, meaning to be a co or to be joined together with. And he also uses the phrase having the same mind to describe their common unity in ministry with one another. Well, Paul mentions here in verse 15 how in the early days of the gospel, no other church helped to support him except for them, except for the Philippian church. And the Philippians have aided and supported Paul all along the way. And we also see in this section Epaphroditus' name again. Uh, remember, Paul described him in chapter 2 as his brother, as his fellow uh, co-worker and fellow soldier. But here at the end of the letter, we get a little more context regarding Epaphroditus. The Philippians... Uh, had sent Epaphroditus with gifts for Paul, and also that Epaphroditus would help uh, attend and minister to Paul's needs while he was there. Well, Paul sees that their partnership together is much more than just giving, just supporting monetarily. He sees them as sharing in ministry with him, and even in his distress. And so our point for today that we will focus on is living a grace-filled life means that we live with a spirit of generosity. Living a grace-filled life means that we live with a spirit of generosity. There is a strong connection between grace and generosity. Remember the the Greek words that we talked about last week, uh, the word for gift shares a common root with the word grace. The spirit of generosity that we are going to talk about today, it all starts with God's grace. In fact, another way to describe God's grace is God's generosity toward us. As we talked about in our very first lesson on Philippians, grace is the self-giving action of God toward sinners. In the words of German theologian Karl Barth, in the relationship of God to man, determined by his love, there takes place something, something very radical. For God's love is not a divine state, It is an act. Indeed, it is the life act of God. It is the act of his self-giving, of his self-giving to sinful man. Grace is the act of giving solely on the part of God. It starts in the first pages of the Bible. In Genesis 1, God is the creator of all. God's act of creating is an act of giving God not only gives in creation, He gives us breath and life. Our very existence is a testimony to the generosity of our Creator. 
To say that God creates is to say that God gives. God not only gives in creation, but God gives in redemption. The cross is the greatest representation of God's generosity toward us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. In the beginning of Galatians, it actually it sounds a lot like Philippians, but look at what Paul goes on to say. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins. And skipping down, still in Galatians to chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I also like how Paul puts it in Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all. While we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, He it is who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for Himself a people of His own who are zealous for good deeds. Jesus becomes for us the visible, physical embodiment of God's grace. Redemption is an act of God giving. It's God's generosity. And because of God's self-giving love for us, believers, we have an obligation under grace, to love one another. And knowing the depths of God's love for us, we are compelled to live humbly, gratefully, and joyfully in love and generosity. But there's a problem. We don't always live with the spirit of generosity. And let me say here that I don't simply mean generosity in terms of monetary giving. Monetary giving is merely one outlet of living with the spirit of generosity. And someone can give monetarily, but for the wrong reasons at heart. You know, that's not what the spirit of generosity is. For example, Jesus teaches about giving in a Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where he says, "'Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Generosity is an outward display of love. It is being for someone that is other than yourself, with no expectation of return payment or recognition. The problem is we want recognition for the good things that we do. Even if we maybe don't admit it, sometimes we really have this inward struggle uh, to let our good deeds be done without recognition. That urge for recognition comes from our own pride. Uh, and our own sense of self-righteousness. But living with a true spirit of generosity calls us to give with humility. Well, we also have a problem living with a spirit of generosity because, darn it, sometimes we just don't want to be generous. We don't feel like it. Uh, let's just be brutally honest. Sometimes we just don't want to. We live in a time when everything is at our fingertips if we have the money, or sometimes if we don't. Just with credit cards and one-day shipping, we barely even have to wait for anything. A bigger pandemic than COVID-19 is the pandemic of consumerism. I'm not saying that we have to feel guilty about each and everything that we purchase, but maybe before we buy something, we need to ask ourselves, how are we serving others? How are we living with the spirit of generosity? There's a Christian thinker by the name of Miroslav Volf. Love that name, Miroslav Volf. And he wrote a book entitled, Free of Charge, Giving and Forgiving in a Culture Stripped of Grace. I I recommend it to you. But in it, he talks about two paradoxes, the paradox of self-love and the paradox of true love. He writes this, 
the self will lose itself if it simply lives in and for itself. It will seek only its own benefits, and the more it seeks its own benefits, the less satisfied it will become. That's the paradox of self-love. The more you fill the self, the more it echoes with the emptiness of unfulfillment. Living in itself and for itself, the self remains mysteriously unsatisfied and insatiable. Since God creates the self to be indwelled by Christ, that self will be fulfilled only if it draws the living water from the wellspring of love's infinity and passes it on to its neighbors. The paradox of true love is exactly the opposite of the paradox of self-love. When loving truly, the self moves outside of itself to dwell with God and neighbor, and only then is it truly at home. When this happens, we have crossed over from self-centeredness to genuine and fulfilling generosity. We live in a culture that is stripped of grace. Our world needs Christians to exemplify grace. And we do this through living grace-filled lives. Living a grace-filled life receives and embraces God's generosity while also allowing it to flow from us. To be imitators of God, to reflect the image and likeness of God, to be conformed to the image of Christ is to live with a spirit of extravagant generosity. So what does it mean to live with a spirit of generosity? Well, It means that we start with God's grace, okay? And the gift of God's grace leads us first to faith. Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. When we realize that we are not our own, but that we belong to God, we also realize that everything we have, even the breath in our lungs, is a gift we have been given because our God is a generous God. I want to share what Miroslav Volf says about faith. He says, faith is an expression of the fact that we exist so that the infinite God can dwell in us and work through us for the well-being of the whole creation. If faith denies anything, it denies that we are a tiny, self-obsessed specks of matter who are reaching for the stars but remain hopelessly nailed to the earth, stuck in our own self-absorption. Faith is the first part of the bridge from self-centeredness to generosity. Well, he goes on to say that faith necessarily leads to gratitude. And we talked about uh, a number of weeks ago how gratitude is an aspect of living a grace-filled life. But connected to this idea of gratitude is also a sense of contentment. You know, it's hard to be grateful if we're not also content with what we have. And Paul models this in our text today where he says, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. We will never find satisfaction in all the things that we buy, but we will in the blessings that we both receive from God and give to others. Satisfaction for our soul, as we talked about last week, is found when we delight in God and we walk in obedience to God. And delighting in God leads us to live with a spirit of generosity. We were created, we were designed to be givers like God. Reflecting the likeness of God necessitates this, but it's in our sin that we become takers, like Adam and Eve in the garden who took of the fruit. When we take for ourselves, we sin. God calls us to give. God calls us to live lives of generosity. Well, the sense of gratitude that we have from living in God's grace leads us then to surrender ourselves, to be used by God, And in surrendering to God, we participate with God's ongoing acts of grace and love and mercy and generosity. God's generosity not only flows into us, but it flows through us and out from us. So today, consider for yourself, what is your attitude of generosity? 
What is your habit of generosity? How are you allowing God's grace not to just end with you, but to flow from you? Friends, everything in the Christian life begins with God's grace. It is sustained by God's grace. It points to God's grace. It hinges on God's grace, and it ends with God's grace. This idea of grace serves as the bookends to Paul's letters. We saw grace at the beginning in a salutation, but we also see this idea of grace at the very end. So, I'll end this sermon and the series through Philippians in the most appropriate way that I can think of, and that is to quote Paul's final line in Philippians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Thank you.
wrapped up our series through the book of Philippians, and I hope that it's been both meaningful and insightful for your own life. As followers of Christ, we are called to live grace-filled lives, and a part of that call to live a grace-filled life is to live with the spirit of generosity. Please receive the benediction. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.